All right, just a bit of recap to get us caught up to speed. In, in verse 1 of chapter 3, uh, Solomon introduces to us this concept of, of, of time uh, to, to humble us. Uh, using this one very specific word in Aramaic to indicate it, the word zimon, and, and it's best translated appropriate time. It, de- depending on what Bible you have, you might just have it there as time, but I believe only the NAS and the LSB have it there as appropriate time. It's very significant. And it means that the events of life simply don't occur by, by happenstance, or, or by some other uh, random means, but, but know that they have been appointed. They have been preemptively established. They have been foreordained by God. It, and it speaks both to God's providence and his sovereignty, or, or in other words, his absolute control and his ultimate authority. That basically the events in life are all preordained by God who is in heaven presiding over earth, which is stated in verse 1, under heaven, which is a bit different from the often used term that he uses many times in Ecclesiastes, under the sun. While under the sun refers to man's perspective, life lived on a human existence level, under heaven indicates that it is under God's realm, under the rule and the throne of God, that we live under the sun, which is under heaven. And as Christians, as believers in the word of God, we, we understand God's sovereignty. We understand God's providence. We understand that as we read certain events in biblical history that have been foretold beforehand, through prophecy, we understand how God works. E- events like the establishment of Israel, uh, first as a people and then as a nation. Uh, events like God's judgment of si- sinful Israel, uh, their exile, and then their return back into the land of Israel where they were taken out of. And, and then the, the most important of biblical events, the, the, the most important thing, the, the most important event to our faith, the, the birth, the, the ministry, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, from the dead. Our, our very faith is based on these foreordained, appointed events recorded in this book, and as well as other prophetic books, uh, events that are set to come at their appointed time. But Solomon here, he, he shows us that not just the, the, the prophetic events recorded and foretold in Scripture are appointed by God, but all events that happen on earth are appointed by God. Everything. And, and then as we read in verses 2 through 8, Solomon just gives us this wonderful poem about the events that God has ordained. The, everything including birth, death, planting and harvesting, emotions like sadness and laughter, uh, events in human relationships, uh, events with our own possessions, even even war and peace are foreordained by God. There is no space or place in life where God does not have control or authority. And again, this concept, this biblical doctrine— is at the very core of our faith. That absolute control and authority over all things is a quality that's only attributed to God and God alone. R.C. Sproul said that if, one, if there is one single molecule in this universe running around loose, totally free of God's sovereignty, then we have no guarantee that a single promise of God will ever be fulfilled. It's very important to our faith. Furthermore, Solomon states in verse 11, where we left off the last time, that that God has made everything appropriate in its time. This word appropriate can also be translated beautiful, which describes God's perfection in orchestrating events in life under the sun, that his rule is even over the hearts of men. 
In the next expression there in verse 11, he says that he has also set eternity in the hearts of men. God has even appointed this innate longing in us for that, that which is eternal and beyond this fleeting vapor of this temporary existence on this earth. And finally, the reason why God has set eternity in our hearts was so that man would not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. That man will never be able to understand all that, that God has instituted. He, he can do all the investigation he wants, but at the end of the day, we will still have questions that will go unanswered. The appointed events mentioned in verse 2 through, through, through 8 leave us with questions that produce unsatisfactory answers. We understand that birth and death is ordained by God, for example. But it still doesn't explain why, for example, uh, some babies are born from sexual assault or, or from sinful unions while uh, uh, faithful Christian couples are still struggling to have kids. It doesn't answer how some evil people seem to always escape death and, and live this, this long, evil life, while there's those who live in the fear of God who can suddenly die as a result of someone's negligence. And how these questionable events that don't make any sense fit into God's sovereign and perfectly flawless plan. They don't make sense to finite beings like us with limited understanding. And God reserves such knowledge because we are man and simply he is God. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 2 says that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Job chapter 42 verse 3, he addresses God as the one who hides counsel without knowledge. And Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. I mean, even with all the theological knowledge we can learn, we just could still never grasp all the, the whys and the hows that we have in, in regards to God's appointed uh, foreordained events taking place every day under heaven that we experience. But though we, we may not know everything that our God does, or why, we can take rest in knowing who he is, and his providential control is for our good. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, you know this, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. That's our resolve. And Solomon has a resolve as well. Here in verse, verse uh, 12 through 22, Solomon, the, the preacher, Koheleth here, he shares with us these observations about life and on this fallen world in God's sovereign rule. Solomon himself has taken life through a thorough analysis and here he is bringing these observations into view, and now he is reflecting on what he knows, what he has learned, and what he has seen. The questions that he has had in chapter 1 and 2, those questions have now become answers. And, and what started off as inquiries in chapters 1 and 2 now turned into solutions, starting with chapter 2, verse 24, uh, in, in, in verse uh, 24 of chapter 2. And then he comes, as he comes to these, solution, uh, these, these, these conclusions, Solomon here gives us five reflections about life under the sun and under heaven that should give us perspective on how to think about life. If you're taking notes, I'll list them out here. Reflections on man's privilege, verse 12 through 13. Reflections on God's power, verses 14 through 15, reflections on God's justice, verse 16 through 17, reflections on man's judgment in verses 18 through 21, and then reflections on man's lot in life, finally, in verse 22. Let's begin. Reflections on, on 
man's privileges or man's privilege. In verse 12, he says, I know that there is nothing better for them, speaking about man, to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. First of all, to say I know is a confident statement that this means that throughout all of the uncertainties of life and all the unanswered questions that there's something that he can be certain of. And on top of that, he makes another uh, there is nothing better statement, which expresses even more confidence of what he knows to be true. The, the first statement we encountered was in, in chapter 2, verse 24, where he says, there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and have his soul see good in his labor. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. And we'll see another uh, there is nothing better statement at the end of this chapter here, uh, a, a statement that sort of bookends this final section here in, in chapter three. But to say that there is nothing better is not only a confident statement, but that it's also a, a conclusive statement. He, he's, he's saying that he knows the absolute best thing that man could achieve in life. Remember, Solomon is, is looking for advantage. He, he's looking for profit. He said in, in chapter 1, verse 3, what advantage does man have in all his work, which, he's done, which, he, has done, uh, which, he, which he does under the sun? And he says what it is, what, what, you, come, what, what you are to come out of it with. He, two things in this verse. Number one, uh, he says to rejoice, to rejoice. This could also be translated to be glad. And we see this, this theme of enjoyment that runs throughout the whole entire book, this search for pleasure. Yet, whereas Solomon had once brought too much stock in, in pleasure and enjoyment, thinking that it was the end-all, be-all in life, he saw it in the things of this world apart from God. But however, let's not think that enjoyment is something that belongs to the world alone that it's a, uh, or that pleasure is simply a carnal or fleshly appetite. It's because what God provides, what comes from his hand, gives us pleasure. We get to enjoy his blessings. And even in this cursed world, we, we do get to experience gladness, which is a cause for rejoicing, is it not? And I would even venture to say that, that for most, or not all of us, experience in the, the regular course of our lives, in the regular course of the events or the appointed times in our lives, that we experience more praiseworthy reasons to rejoice than we experience trials and, and other things that bring us suffering. That those things are more intermittent than the, the, the cause that we have for rejoicing. I mean, even when we're suffering, even, even if there's a sense in where we're, we're the suffering has become a part of our lives, there becomes a point that, that we learn to, to, to look past it, to look beyond it, and it doesn't keep us down. We'll find reasons to rejoice, and we should, because God gives us the privilege of rejoicing. And this is also a common grace, indeed, that, meaning that all men, regardless of their spiritual condition or their standing with God, they experience this universal grace from God. And rejoicing is also having is gratitude, better yet, thankfulness. And, and the difference between gratitude and thankfulness is both of them are a hard attitude. Uh, it, they're both a, a state of appreciation. But gratefulness is, is or, or, or gratitude is a state of appreciation that one can can just have about their fortunate situation. There's many unbelievers that are grateful for where they are in life, right? Anyone can be grateful in life. But to be thankful is something different. To be thankful is actually a response. It's a response recognizing that what you have received from the hands for you, what you have, you have received from the hands of someone else. And ultimately, I'm, I'm referring, of course, to, to God. Thankfulness is rejoicing, not in just the gift, but in appreciating the hand of the giver. And this is significant because 
Some commentators actually take Ecclesiastes to be written from a, a rather pessimistic point of view, which is a, a, a view I don't exactly hold to. I may have said that before. And it's because, in general, to maintain an optimistic or pessimistic point of view, it means that you interpret everything in life through the lens of negativity or, or positivity. In other words, for an optimist, no matter how bad things go, you can see the, the, the bright side of it. Or for a pessimist, no matter how, how good things are going, you can always see something bad about it, right? You can find something negative to complain about. And for this reason, pessimists are usually very unthankful people all of the time. They're unhappy about everything. It, even when everything comes from the providential hand of God, they have reason to complain about it. They never rejoice because they see everything as bad. However, thankful people are completely the opposite. They consistently live in a state of thankfulness. And for that reason, they rejoice. It's the only way you can rejoice. Consider a familiar and, and classic exhortation we have from Paul the Apostle rejoicing out of a, a thankful heart. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Very familiar passage in Scripture. Paul exhorts, saying in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I love this. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence in anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Consider these things. Now, a person who lives in the light of this passage, they set their minds to consider these things, and they can always have a reason to rejoice. And Solomon says that there's nothing better, nothing of value that compares with this, that man should be glad. And the second thing, that there's, no, there's nothing better than this, he says, is that man does good. And this, this could be referring to, to doing good in a moral sense as and having righteous behavior, or it could refer to doing good in terms of being productive, more of an industrial sense, doing well in your, your work. As again, work is a common theme throughout the whole book of Ecclesiastes. But either way, Solomon says it's a reward that man gets to experience by the grace of God. So doing good. And keep in mind that these two things, rejoicing and doing good, can only be experienced within the the, the context of time, and this is why he says that they must be done in one's lifetime. In one's lifetime. Because life is short and fleeting. We recognize that. Yet its days should be filled with thanksgiving and productivity. Not in, in worrying about uncertainties in life and things that are under God's control. And next he adds to it in, in verse 13. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It is a gift of God. Again, this is a common grace. He says every man who eats and drinks. And again, speaks to a common experience that we all have, eating and drinking. We talked about that last time. Eating, drinking, and labor. We all work. Remember that eating and drinking are also mentioned several other times in this book. Many other times in this book. And later on, Solomon refers to eating and drinking and labor again as a gift from God. Not only that, but also as a reward. As a reward. And as I mentioned before, these things represent the, the three most normal examples of earthly satisfaction that man can have in this world. Food, drink, and, and work or labor. Food and drink actually satisfy. They satisfy hunger and thirst. And work or labor satisfy man's need for productivity, for creativity. 
And God graciously gives man this satisfaction. And notice also in verse 12 that Solomon lists to do good as reward. But now here in verse 13, that one sees good is also a reward. That he gets to experience it. And as we know, work involves toil and pain, but it is also rewarded with something good. Namely, a paycheck, right? Compensation. Or, or you can say even back in the Bible days, uh, produce. That's for the purpose of eating and drinking. And the work helps one to receive satisfaction from sustenance. When you eat and drink, that's a reward for your labor. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 26 says, A worker's appetite works for him, for his hunger urges him on. And to work hard and to provide for oneself, Solomon says, is a gift from God, not to be taken for granted. Again, food in and of itself is a gift from God. Fortunately, we get to experience that every day. Because God is the one who provides food. We, we live in a culture where we think food is a right. And I think just because we work hard for our money and we, we obviously have a choice on where we get our food from and what we want to eat, we, we assume that we actually deserve it. That we actually deserve it to be perfect. And we complain when, when it's not. And sure, even Christians, we pray and we say thanks before every single meal, sometimes out of rote. But if the food doesn't meet our expectations, like I said last time, if we might be inclined, inclined to complain about it, to grade it, to compare it to something else that we've had before in the past, and even go so far as to leave a negative review, a review on Yelp. <laughs> now, granted, if the food is barely edible and kind of thrown together, you know, without respect for the customer and this hard-earned dollar, it's understandable. But in the grand scheme of things, we know that we don't actually deserve better, right? I mean, because we've all sinned against a holy God, have we not? And we don't want what we actually deserve, do we? Because Romans 6 verse 23 says the wages of sin, in other words, the, the hard-earned deserved payment for sin is what? Death. So do you see food as a gift from God? Do you deserve to eat every day? What about your job? Do you recognize that the job that you probably dread going to tomorrow morning is God's providence in your life? Unfortunately, some of us receive good, but we never see good because our perspective's off. We don't even notice it, but that's man's privilege. Brings us to our next point, reflections on God's power. Verses 14 through 15, Solomon makes another confident statement in verse 14. He says, I know that everything God does remains, will remain forever. And this should remind us in chapter one, where he said in, in verse four, um, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. And then he described these endless cycles that God established from the foundation of the world, this created order. Genesis chapter eight, verse 22 says, while the earth remains seed time and harvest and cold and heat in summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. These things are lasting forever. Man's soul is also an eternal soul. Even though his physical frame will die, his soul continues to exist eternally, either in eternal life with God or in eternal judgment from God. And then he says that there is nothing to, to add to it and there's nothing to take away from it. That God's works are complete, that they're whole, that there's nothing lacking in his works or in his plans. 
A man cannot contribute or take away anything that God has already established in heaven. And sure, we know that God has orchestrated events in our lives that will take place in their appointed time, but, but we have no knowledge of when those appointed times are. Just a simple fact that we don't know how long we're going to live or when we will die or how we will die is a sobering reality that should humble us. James chapter 4, verse 13, James says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. He says, yeah, you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this and that. Sure, we can... We can plan, we can have intentions and ideas, but we can't with any confidence set our own appointed times in our lives. James says to do that is arrogance and evil boasting. And this is why he says, for God has so worked that men should fear him. Recognizing man's inability to control things and God's ultimate authority to control all things should bring man to the end of himself to realize that the, that the power of God and, and, to, and to cause him to fear his creator. The fear of God is the end all, be all. God has made all things appropriate or beautiful in his time, and to fear God in light of that is a appropriate response, a wise response. Job chapter 28, verse 28 says, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Psalm 111, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Good understanding have all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. Furthermore, several times in the book of Proverbs, Solomon's other book of wisdom shows us how to navigate through life. Solomon there, he keeps driving the point home to fear God, and he shows us the correlation between that and wisdom. And I'll just read a couple of them here. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. It's the end all, be all. And to top it all off, this, the fear of the Lord, is the whole point of Ecclesiastes. Just a sneak peek to the end of the book, he says in, in chapter 12, verse 13, that the conclusion, when all has been heard, is this. Fear God and keep his commandments because that applies to every person. For God will bring every act into judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. This is how we should live in the fear of the Lord. It's not only the uh, appropriate response, but it's a, an all-encompassing attitude on how we're to make decisions, how we're to, to speak, how even, we, uh, even down to how we should think. And next Solomon says in verse 15 that that which is, which is has been already and that which will be has already been. For God seeks which has passed by. A little, difficult, little difficult verse there. But it's basically saying this, that for us living on earth, we experience these appointed times and these events in their foreordained plan that is just unfolding and revealing itself to us every day. That's, that's our human experience. But yet to God in heaven, what is new to us is not new to him. They have already been. They've already been decided and established from eternity past. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, God has spoken, saying, Remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. In verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not yet been done. 
saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Let us remind ourselves that God is not merely responding to things or life on earth. He, he knows what we need before we even ask. He answered prayers before we even prayed them. He's already decided beforehand things that will occur in the future. And to illustrate that even more, look at the next verse in verse 16. He says, furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there is wickedness and in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. This is, this is the reflections on God's justice, his ultimate control. Notice again that what he says this is what he has witnessed under the sun. Uh, different from under heaven in verse 1 where he speaks again from God's perspective. In, in contrast to this, he's now speaking from a human perspective on a human level. That this is what he has seen. That there is here on earth two different realms of government over man. And the first one is this, a, a place of justice. This is referring to the judicial system the law system, the political system. And, and Solomon was over all of that as the king of Israel. But even today, we have all of these different systems, but we also have a regulatory system. And all of these things are under the realm of human earthly control to govern humanity. And these institutions, believe it or not, have been set up by God himself. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. You know, Paul says in verse 3 of this same chapter that rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. And then in verse 4, he says that it, it's a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Even though that's true, Solomon says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 16, that in the place of justice, there's also the presence of wickedness. That, that evil men, men who have ungodly purposes and ungodly intentions, are, are actually in positions of power in the place where justice should be exercised. And Solomon, as well as all the kings in power before and after him illustrate this perfectly. There's not a perfect man in any of them. There's many of the kings over Israel and Judah, including Solomon. Scripture says that they've all done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he also says that next that in this place, in the place of righteousness, there's also wickedness. This is a, another realm of government, government uh, referring now to the, the religious system, the church, where, where the worship of God is led. Even today in the church, there is the presence of wickedness. There are pastors and church leaders all over this world who are, who are sinful, who are crooked, and have no fear of God as they prey upon the flock. These things are happening currently in our world. Injustice where there should be justice and unrighteousness where you would expect there to be righteousness. And again, the existence of these things cause us to ask why? How? Because from our perspective under the sun, they don't make sense. How is it that evil, sinful people that, 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 that exist that God has established them in a place where we are to, to expect justice and righteousness. Yet Solomon brings us back into God's perspective in heaven in the next verse. He says, I, I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man 
and the wicked man, for a time for every matter and every deed is there. Those realms of human control under the sun is under heaven and under God's sovereign control. That there will be a future judgment for all men. Both the righteous and the wicked man will undergo their own day where they will individually stand before the Lord and give an account. This is all over the New Testament. I'll just read a few of them. Romans chapter 2 verse 6 that God will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who, by perseverance in doing good, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. And later on in Romans 14, verse 12, he says, So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring to light, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose, disclose the, the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. What about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But to the one who sows to the spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. I could go on and on. That there will be a day where the wicked will stand in judgment and receive their sentencing in the lake of fire, in Revelation, while those who have been declared righteous by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ will stand before him at the bema seat to receive their eternal reward. And though these matters are currently being played out here on earth and we experience them and they, we, we see them, uh, the judgment of these things has already been decided in heaven. Everything, every deed done within this time frame will be brought into account on a preordained day at an appointed time. And next, uh, another reflection in, in verse 18, reflections on man's judgment says, I, I said to myself concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. He's done these things in order that man may see it. For man to come to this conclusion, to arrive at this due to God's testing him. Another statement similar to Verse 14 in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I mean Ecclesiastes chapter 3, when Solomon said, For God has so worked so that men may fear him. That God has a purpose in these things. And how these examples of sovereign control are meant to bring men's hearts to a sobering and humble perspective. Mankind has been created in the image of God and placed in the highest order over all life on this earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then it says, Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps in the earth. And next in in verse 28 of of Genesis chapter 1, it says, And God blessed them and, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on earth. But but though man is placed and given this place of authority, Solomon says that he's still no better than the animals in the grand scheme of things. And he explains why. Look down at verse 13, uh, verse 19. For the... 
the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they, have all, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage over, uh, for man over beast, for all is vanity. If you remember back in chapter 2, Solomon brings this great equalizer called death into perspective. In, in chapter 2, verse 13, he says that I, I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness, and that the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. And he's talking about death. That though practically, the, though the wise man does have an advantage over the foolish man, that both of them share the same ending of their lives. As I mentioned before, death levels the playing field for all kinds of people. Rich, poor, healthy, weak. Everyone, they're all in a grave right now. And likewise, death equalizes both man and animal. All living creatures meet the same fate or event. There's a little insect called a dainty mayfly, and it has a lifespan of just 24 hours. And there are turtles and sea creatures that live for hundreds of years, much longer than any man, but yet in the end, they will all die, just like man. And he says in verse 20 that all go to the same place, all came from the dust and all return to the dust. Both man and beast were created from the ground. Again, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, it says, Then God said, Let the earth, well, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. And again, this is a humbling experience or a humbling perspective given to us to, to shatter any pride remaining in ourselves. That though we are, as humans, higher in the pecking order of God's creation, we are no better. So today when you get home and your dog greets you at the door, you look him square in the eye and you just tell him, we're in this together. <laughs> both man and beast are both made from the dust, but there is one thing that does set them apart in death. God, man's judgment. Look at verse 21. He says, For who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of the beast descends downward to the earth? This is referring to afterlife. Afterlife. On this verse, Derek Kidner says, Man and beast are are alike in dying, but distinct beyond the grave. And this word breath here refers to soul or spirit. And the direction here, man, man's soul going upward and the beast's soul going downward, describes what does set man and, and beast apart from in, in death, and, and that's eternity. Animals don't experience an eternal experience. Unfortunately, all dogs do not go to heaven. <laughs> Though man and beast were created from the earth, it was man who was created in the image of God. Again, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And then it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that the Lord formed man out of the dust from the ground, but he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then man became a living soul as a result. Solomon already said back in verse 17 of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that man has an appointed day of judgment, a day of reckoning with God where while there is no judgment day for animals. I have a dog. He's a cool little guy. I love this guy. And for dogs, he's been on earth for a very long time. Past the average lifespan of dogs, he's 14 years old now, about to be, be 15 and we spent lots of time together. And again, we share a common bond. Sometimes we share food. And we also share this experience that we will both someday die. But I will stand before God while his existence will end. And again, that reality is intended to bear upon our hearts that, that, so that we would live with fear 
and that we would live with a humble perspective. Last verse here. Reflections on man's lot in life in verse 22. I have seen that nothing is better than that man should be happy in his activities, for that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? This is that other, there's nothing better than statement. Where Solomon boils life down to what's important and what is the ultimate good that that man can have on this fleeting experience on earth. And it's very similar to how he started in verses 12 and 13. And and that's because the the word translated happy here in in the last verse here is in, in the Hebrew, it's the same exact word that's translated rejoice in verse 12. It's the same exact word. It means to be glad. And I love this because, again, Solomon's problems began when he he tried and attempted to achieve satisfaction and enjoyment and happiness apart from God in in, in these earthly activities, these worldly activities. But Solomon here says it's good to be happy in your activities. While rejoicing is the external response, Happiness is an internal state, and it can't be achieved from external circumstances, but rather from an internal perspective. And he says that, for that is his lot, in other words, our portion, this is our duty, that we have our own lane to stay in. It's not for us to understand all the complexities of life and the decisions that have been made by God in heaven for man under heaven. We have a responsibility here on this earth, an, act, an, occu- an occupation to keep us occupied, a perspective to keep, us, to keep us humble but happy. Our appointed times and, and life events are known only to God but are uncertain to us. Yeah, he is in total control and we are under his total care. But knowing the fear of God, also the character of God, should should give us a happy humility that we can live by. Life, Life seems so complicated, doesn't it? But it is so simple. So simple. Stay in your lane. Fear God. Trust God. That's how to live. In closing, Herbert Leupold says that if it depends on God and his predetermined plan, what shall be done and what not, it is quite in vain for man to hope by his efforts to stem the tide of adversity or to hasten the day of mercy. Man can thus learn to surrender to a guidance that will prevail whether man consents or not, which is yet a guidance that can in every case be trusted Absolutely. And we can trust him, right? Yes, we can. May we learn to rest in his sovereign providence and providence, recognizing our role, our lane, and in, 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 in maintaining an attitude of thankfulness.